So, hello, welcome back after lunch. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. And I want to welcome you to this 60-minute uh, session on not only reactive data access with Spring Data. This used to be a 90-minute session, but we actually decided to strip it down to 60 minutes and have a, a really dedicated session, actually two dedicated sessions on reactive data access right afterwards in this very room. So this is going to be a 60-minute session. We're going to cover a few bits of the reactive stuff, but we are going to deep dive into that uh, in the upcoming sessions, and I'm going to point you to that uh, later on during the talk. So uh, who am I, actually? I'm Christoph Strobel. I work for Pivotal, obviously, on the data team. And there I'm responsible for the store abstractions around MongoDB, Redis, and Solar. And as you might know, there is a bunch of modules out there. So nobody on the team basically has all the deep knowledge into all those modules. So today with me, there is the amazing John Bloom, who takes care of our Apache, uh, of our Geode and Apache uh, of our Gemfire and Apache Geode modules, as well as the Cassandra one. So within the team, we try to spread knowledge so that there is always two people actually working on a very module so that we don't get stuck if someone gets sick and whatnot. And actually, John is later on trying, uh, going to cover the Cassandra and Geode modules, and I'm going to cover uh, the rest of uh, what we're going to show today. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at what happened for the Spring Data K release train. Actually, uh, it's the first major release since the Spring Data inception. And so we worked on it for almost over a year. We fixed over 700 issues in there. In those very 15 modules, we also added the Geo, uh, Apache Geo module for the release train. And with the K-release, we took the opportunity to re revisit some of the concepts that we have within Spring Data. Uh, we also took the opportunity to introduce some breaking changes. We'll go through those uh, uh, within the talk, at least over some of those. And uh, we also... Uh, worked very hard on our reactive story. But in this talk, as I told you before, we're trying uh, to focus not only on the reactive story, because there, there is a lot of uh, good things that we added for just uh, that are non-reactive. And we're going to have a look at those. And in the end, uh, I hope to have time to give you a, a short outlook on what the team is actually planning for the upcoming release uh, called Loveless. So we already got uh, a bunch of features in the pipeline, and we already can show you some code of uh, what we plan to do there. So let's jump right into the Spring Data K release and uh, the core themes that we had actually there. Uh, the first thing uh, that you will recognize when you basically switch to Spring Data K is that when, when you look at the repository, and I guess many of you are using the CRUD repository, then we had this uh, ID extends serializable stuff in there, which uh, was actually only required by the JPA module, because most of the NoSQL stores uh, didn't require the ID to be serializable. So what you recognize first is when you upgrade that uh, this basically, this limitation has gone, so you can now uh, just use any ID that you want, but if you're using, happen to use one of the JPA stores or uh, JPA uh, implementations like Hibernate, you still have to make sure that you're using an ID that is serializable anyways. But yeah, this is uh, something you'll recognize pretty early, and uh, so will you uh, recognize that we with the lift, basically, to Java 8 as a minimum runtime requirement and Spring 5, that we uh, introduced uh, optional throughout the code base very much. Um, so the previous find one method that we have in there uh, no longer returns uh, null values, but rather gives you an optional of T. So within the entire Spring Data code base, uh, especially the parts that we expose to you, uh, 
the, the public parts internally, we still had, have to deal in some places with null values because the, the constant wrapping and unwrapping would have a uh, performance impact in the computation that we do in there in the generics resolution and there for the JIT compiler and whatnot. But uh, on the repository side, it definitely makes sense to just use the Java uh, 8 optional uh, stuff there. And so find one no longer gives you null values, but gives you an optional in there. And uh, a thing that we discussed heavily within the team and the community in the related ticket uh, that was opened was the naming of the uh, methods that we offered within the repository. So uh, when you look at the uh, pre-K repository, we had those methods like find one, find all, save, and delete methods. And once you happen to actually, let's say, we have the save method for an object and an iterable, uh, and once your domain object, which can happen, potentially implements iterable for whatever reason of that very type, then you'd run into method ambiguities, which is a bad thing, because, uh, yeah, how would the compiler find out which, which one to invoke? So we changed the naming of all those, those methods a, a bit uh, to express m more clearly what they are about. So what we did, we changed all those methods that take an ID to basically uh, be named like you would write when you would write in it in a derived finder method. So uh, those find one have been replaced with find by ID. And of course, all the methods that take an iterable or took an iterable by now are now named find all by yada, yada, yada. You know what I mean? The same applies to the save all and delete methods. So the naming is now pretty, pretty straightforward and, and doesn't yield any surprises. And the method ambiguities are gone with that approach as well. But this is something you'll, you'll recognize when you upgrade your existing, uh, existing application. I mean, sure, you can cope with that by just applying a bunch of default methods. But anyways, if you're starting a new project, uh, this is the way uh, to go forward. Uh, another thing that you might have recognized, if you ever did a, a custom implementation of a repository, who's done that before? Uh, yeah, quite a few. Um, what you had to do is basically you had to have the repository and then this interface, your custom repository interface, and then you had to basically have an implementation that was the repo with impl at the end that implemented the custom instead of the repo, which was kind of weird because uh, you would have expected to be the, the, the custom implementation of something and not the repository implementation. And uh, with that approach, you had only the option of having one custom implementation for an interface. Um, so we changed that a bit uh, to have it just uh, more straightforward. So as you can see, we now support having uh, the interface declared up there and just use the very same interface name so that it aligns smoothly. You still can use strategies and patterns that you used to uh, to just end the, uh, alter the suffix if you don't like the impulse style. Uh, but anyways, it, it becomes way more clear what you're actually trying to achieve with that. And of course, you can now have multiple of those custom implementations and we're gonna pick them up on startup and just add them to the proxy invocation that we're doing when you basically uh, call a method on the repository. So this is pretty nice and, and empowers you basically to, to split up your code a little bit and be more focused on when you, what you actually want to achieve with your custom implementation. And another thing that we did uh, is we added a bunch of nullability annotations um, anyone's already using nullability annotations? Yeah, a few. A few. Uh, those are really nice because they are supported by uh, various by IDEs already. So there is IntelliJ that offers support and, of course, Eclipse. So those are annotations that uh, basically help you develop your applications because they can give you warnings uh, when you try to enter uh, null values into an API that is supposed to not uh, receive null values. 
I mean, in the spring ecosystem, we normally try, uh, we normally cope with that by asserting that certain values are not null and you would get an exception in that case. But uh, you don't have the exception when you actually just use the compiler. But in this case, the IDE can help you and just put out a warning that you're doing something that you're not supposed to do. So we just went through our code base, adding the nullability annotations there, which was a good exercise for us uh, as developers as well, because we, we found quite a few locations where we actually were doing things or assuming things that we shouldn't have done. Uh, but yeah, this really helps, and I would encourage you to check it out. The support, the IDE support is really great in there. And we even went one step further with that. So once you're in a, let's say, a environment where you don't allow nullable values within your methods, and you still use it and pass a null into your method, then we go on and assert uh, on the fly that the method shouldn't be null, or if you return it in this case, so you have a method like this, find by first name, that is supposed to never return a null value, to always find something, then we'll throw you an exception, an incorrect result size exception. And I'm, I've prepared a little demo for that. I hope you, it's big enough for you to read. Uh, what you have to do is basically, you know this package info.java, and what you can do there is basically add the, hello, nope, add the, non-null API annotation there. So for this package, you won't allow any, any null values, either as method arguments nor return types in this case. And when you go to the person repository, which is just a, a normal CRUD repository, and you find the very same method there, find by first name, taking a first name, returning a person, um, then you can basically go there, and I've prepared a test, uh, and just use the repository find by first name, asserting that we'll get uh, a value back there if we just insert the person named Luke uh, right before. So let me just run that, that bloody test. Should hopefully turn green. Yeah, that just worked as expected. I mean, the, the cool thing about the repository support, uh, about the, the IDE support, if I just go there and do something like this, then the IDE would actually throw, uh, give me a warning that I'm doing something wrong in here that I'm not supposed to do. So this is pretty nice. Um, of course, if I now try to find something, you remember, uh, we're not supposed to return any, any null values from the repository anyway. Uh, if I now try to look up a user called Han uh, that doesn't exist, I expect this to give me an empty result data access exception. So we basically inspect the annotation and transform it into an exception once uh, the condition applies. So this is very handy. Let me just quickly run that to prove that it's really, really working. Yeah the test passed. And of course, what you can do, because you potentially don't, even if you declare your package to just be a non-null API, uh, you might want to make exceptions to that. So there is still the at nullable annotation. So you can just tag certain methods in there uh, to allow null values. And this pretty much works the same way. So here's the test, find by null, by first name. Again, we were searching for Han, who doesn't exist, and yeah. Let me go, run this one, and there you go. This works as well. You can even just mix around uh, with the annotations. There is a at uh, non-null and whatnot annotation, so you can add non-null fields uh, annotation. There is a bunch of those in the Spring ecosystem that we recognize. Cool, move on. Uh, what we also did is for specific projects, we added uh, the Kotlin extensions so that once you're using Kotlin, it, Kotlin, it feels more natural when you're actually interacting with the template. It makes uh, definitely sense 
to have those uh, extensions for the template level because there we are passing around class parameters and whatnot. Uh, so it, uh, it makes sense to have it there. For the repositories, we don't really, uh, we talk to our Kotlin expert, Sebastian, and it doesn't really make sense to, to have those Kotlin extensions for repositories because you wouldn't benefit from, uh, from them there. But for the template level for sort of various uh, um, stores, we already offered those, except, uh, those extensions and shipped them with the release. And we, of course, plan to extend the Kotlin support as we move on. So there's other stores already who already confirmed to pick up the Kotlin extensions. So will Neo4j, for example, hopefully within the next release of Fort Loveless, uh, also pick up the Kotlin extensions. We also fine-tuned a bit uh, the projection enhancements that you can do with uh, spell expressions. And in that way, we now basically allow you to, to use the method arguments on a projection interface uh, when you actually call uh, the, the method on the bean that is uh, used within the spell expression. Uh, I guess it gets more clear when I show you the example to that. Let me just quickly, yeah. Okay, so what we got here is, a, is a, just a plain uh, person repository again. We got a find by first name method and in this time instead of a person, we return a person projection. So we're gonna map it to an interface in this case. So this is the interface. It defines a, a getter for the first name. So you basically just provide access to the first name via this getter. So basically the projection will be backed by the target object and then you can uh, invoke uh, the getters in there without passing uh, the entire object to the consumer of the method. And what we got in here is basically the add value annotation. I think my battery is dying. It doesn't really work. Uh, is the add value annotation. And this allows you to call a spring bean and a, speci a specific method on that bean with the target object, which is basically the projection backing object. So if you're using JPA, this will be the, the map of the result set. And of course, the method arguments. If you just specify the args, then it will be the array of arguments that you're using in the method declaration. Or you can even pick one of those arguments to just forward to your method by just selecting the array at its position. And if we now take a look at this bloody uh, um, argument, spring bean, argument processor, oh, I just called it, and you see here, it, there's, this is the target map, uh, and then the, the object array, and we just print out some arbitrary uh, com computation in there. Uh, the same for the, just using the first argument uh, of those arguments, so we just take the first and print it out, and I got the test in here, so this is basically find Luke by first name, and then I'm your father, Luke, and this should hopefully then be computed correctly to say, Luke, I'm your father. Hopefully. Um, oops, the all args test, please. Yep, that worked. We're using Hibernate under the hood, and therefore this is just just the same for the just one argument. Uh, Luke has been 19 years old as far as I know in the first movie, so yeah, that obviously worked as well. So this is just, just a tiny fine tuning, but it offers a, a huge variety of actually uh, capabilities and possibilities. So you can just use any spring bean within the projection itself and just pass in parameters to just do computation, and this is really, really powerful. And of course, there is there is some some more. There's way more than I listed in here. We got a new streamable type. Uh, we also supply you with automatic module names if you're running in Java, on Java 9. We support waiver uh, types uh, out of the box and whatnot. So these are the, the core themes and, and comments that we had, the more interesting ones. There are blog posts out there on our website to just go check them out if you want to see the full list uh, of the stuff that we did. 
we just don't have the time because we want to go into some store specifics as well today. And let me start off with MongoDB. Uh, so who's using MongoDB? This document store, schema-less? Yeah, okay, at least some. Um, when you look at the template API, what you had to deal with was basically uh, this kind of style of API. So there was a find method that took a query, which was obvious, and the person, yeah, well, you could imagine what the person was for. Then it took another argument. So we had four arguments in there, which was Star Wars, which might be the collection. And then we had a Jedi class, which was like, oh, uh, yeah, now I'm lost. And we had to go through this API ourselves, uh, basically, on a daily basis. And yeah, we thought about, isn't there a better way to just express what we want to achieve uh, with that method call? And we came up with some builder style API. So now there is a new entry point on the template that's just called query, and it takes the domain type you want to query for. So you want to query a person in a specific collection, and you want this result uh, not to be returned as a person, but you want to map it potentially to a projection. So this should, the result should be a Jedi class. And you only want to find those whose name is Luke. Makes sense so far. And you want to get all results. So this would give you, would be equivalent to what we saw before, but uh, with way more context and, and you know, uh, so that you really get uh, to know when you read the code what's happening and what to expect when you, when you do this. Let me just, this is this thing, it's Fluent API. There we go. And as you can see here, uh, we are with. This approach, we also go for the optional styles. Uh, so when you go there and call basically first, which will give you the first value of the query you execute, you get an optional uh, of that. I mean, many people are not really into optional because they have to do all this unwrapping to just get is there null and whatnot, on, or are working with code that still deals with null values and is expecting null values to some degree, then they always have to call if, blah, then null, more or less. So what we also have there is we added some, some shortcut for you, which is like find first value, which just unwraps the optional that we get and gives you the plain value, may it be null or not. So this is just for your convenience so that you don't have to do the unwrapping yourself. And yeah, let me just quickly run one Never find Luke, this should be working. Embedded MongoDB under the hood, and yeah, so this works. Um, of course, uh, there might be scenarios why you want to assert that a, a, a query only returns exactly one value and not potentially more, like two or so, and this would be a business error. So we, we thought about that as well. And so you can basically define a template query matching Luke. And this is also a, a nice feature of this Fluent API. You basically, this is a builder style, so you get a new instance every time you alter something. And you can keep an instance, uh, just a variable of that stuff, and then go on and do like, uh, find Luke, and then call one value, first value, all that stuff. Uh, and it's, it even knows where you are in, the, in creating the query, so you only get the, 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 the options that are valid at the current time. But you can basically keep a variable of that stuff and then just reuse it and call all or one depending on your needs, which is actually what we do in the repository implementation. We, we set up the query before and then just reuse it. Okay, let me just remove that. Okay, so what we do here is basically we want to find exactly one value, so this is one value, and if the, we insert another loop, then we expect to have an incorrect result size data access exception, because there is, there is too many of those and we don't want to have it. Uh, let me just run that one. Okay, worked as expected. Then we got the, the projection support uh, for the query, so you just push it to an interface, which is like down, be here, down here, so it really takes, takes the arguments in there and just maps it correctly. And what this is actually for, uh, the, the 
the first domain class is for mapping the query because you might have those field annotations that rename certain fields and whatnot. So that the query mapper basically knows about that. And yeah, you can also do that stuff for, it's not only for finders, but it's also for updates. So there's pretty much every method that you find on the classic uh, template API has its counterpart in the Fluent API. So you can do updates and also use query by example and whatnot to just move on and get the job done. Okay, for, this brings me exactly to the next stuff, the query by example. Uh, a lot of people were actually complaining about stuff we were doing with the query by example, because we inferred when you executed the query something like the, in MongoDB, the, the class identifier, which made sure that you only get classes that exactly match those, but people didn't always want that uh, behavior, but uh, rather, uh, get everything that, that matched, no matter which type it was. Uh, so what you had to do before is was like a little bit ugly, so you had to add something like ignore the path, the class attribute, though it wasn't actually in the domain type because it was inferred by Spring Data, so this was like, uh, we're not too, too happy with that. So what we added for now is an untyped example matcher that you can use which will just eliminate the type checked and it does this for JPA and whatnot. So this is very, very handy so far. And of course we added the reactive Mongo operations as part of our reactive story within Spring Data for MongoDB. We did it for Redis as well and stuff. Uh, and what this does is basically it transforms the, the imperative operations to the uh, reactive execution model and of course the reactive types. You will definitely learn more about that uh, in the upcoming sessions right here at this very room, just the next session. Um, we'll go into the details of that in there. I just wanted to show you that we also of course have the Fluent template API in a reactive fashion. So. What you do here is basically we insert uh, Luke again and then just call and then just go fetch him in a reactive way by just calling the first method which gives us a mono that will emit Luke once he's there. Let me just show that it works and obviously. By the way, via the QR code you can easily jump then later on to the, to the examples. They're all up on GitHub, so you can play around with those if you want to. And uh, something very cool, we also added infinite stream support uh, via the tail command, which just returns you a flux of stuff. And again, this will be part of the next session, but this is really, really awesome and what you can do with it. And of course, we added support for MongoDB 3.6. We had a bunch of aggregation enhancements and collation support, all very nice. Uh, far more uh, work done there. Uh, switch to document API and whatnot. But this is the stuff I wanted to show you. I gotta hurry up a little bit. Um, for Redis, one of the main improvements despite the reactive API was the Redis cache. And if you look at the code, I mean, it, it, it took quite quite an effort to create the Redis cache and the cache manager and uh, you had to create a template and the template knew about how to serialize values to a Redis cache, but the cache itself had the expiration and it was all kind of mixed up and you couldn't potentially reuse the Redis template for anything else than the cache because then it wouldn't work and the serialization would, would go wrong. So we uh, totally threw away that concept and rewrote it. So we have a clear separation between the cache and the Redis template that you use normally in your API, as well as the cache configuration and the actual stuff that it's doing. So we split up the cache configuration and what you see there is basically we have a Redis cache configuration. There is a default already set up for you. You can give it a time to live and you can define the serializer and there are static methods that allow you to just go on with uh, JSON serialization, Java, plain Java serialization, or whatever you expect, and it operates directly on the connection factory. So there is no mix up with the template anymore. And of course, then the Redis cache manager just uses 
a default configuration, but you can also set up individual caches with their very own cache configuration. So you can basically define those cache regions that you have individually with expirations and serialization options. Yeah, that's basically done here. You pass it the name of the cache and then configure it individually, which is a huge improvement. We didn't dare do it in the previous release, but with the 2.0, we are there to, to go that route. And uh, another thing, we split up the Redis connection. So when you look at, looked at the Redis connection, this was pretty much, uh, this is, these aren't even all of the methods that you'd find in there. This is just the ones that, that do something with Redis actually. And we stripped those down to have like dedicated, more narrow interfaces like hyperlog log commands, geo commands, server commands, basically the stuff you find up on the Redis website itself. And this gives you a more focused approach to what you want to do. So you basically go to the connection, say, hey, I want to do a string operation and I want to call the append function so you don't have to deal with all those. This is a tiny improvement, but in our opinion, uh, uh, a real good one. And of course, we did the reactive connection and template API. Uh, a side note, this only works with the Lattice driver uh, for the Jettis driver. Unfortunately, there isn't a reactive API so far, and therefore we just cannot use it uh, for the reactive API. But Mark's, I, uh, I expect him to go into the details within the next session. And with that, I want to hand over to John, who's going to cover Apache, J Cassandra, and Geode, and whatnot. All right, thanks, Christoph. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is John Bloom. I am on the Spring Data team, where I co-lead the Spring Data Cassandra module, as well as the Spring Data Gemfire and Geode modules. And we'll get to Gemfire and Geode in just a bit. How many people here are using Apache Cassandra? Okay, a few people, not too many. All right, well, so Apache Cassandra used to be a public module, or, or a community module, excuse me, last year around spring one time, and Pivotal actually inherited the module to maintain and carry forward. And as of that time, um, we were basically just getting our feet wet in the project and um, basically trying to f ascertain as to which uh, direction we were going to take it in. So as of today, as Spring Data K, we've basically rebased the module on Apache DataStack's Apache Cassandra driver 332. And we've done a bit of cleanup. So there used to be two modules for people that are familiar with the Spring Data Cassandra project. It used to be split between Spring CQL as well as Spring Data Cassandra. The CQL module mainly deals with all the CQL stuff. So CQL template, if you're writing SQL, CQL statements and so on, uh, all that stuff resided in there and the support for that from a Spring perspective. And then the Spring Data Cassandra module contained all the entity support. Um, not yet at that time, there wasn't a, a repository story, but um, there is now. And since that time, we've also condensed that down into one module now. So it makes it very simple for your applications to import that dependency without having to worry about which module some class lives in. So we started with some basic stuff at first. Uh, one of the first things we did is we added batch operations. So Cassandra's API, the DataStacks driver supports the ability to do a group of inserts, updates, or deletes into a batch. So I don't have to do each transaction individually. I can group them together and then fire that off to the cluster uh, on the server. So I've prepared a little demo for that. Let me jump over to my IDE. Yep, here we go. Oops. All right, so when you write a test with Spring Data Cassandra, it's pretty simple. There's a bunch of configuration classes that you can extend to actually get a simple cluster up and running, get a session, access a template and so on. A lot of those beans are provided to you out of the box to get up, get up and going really quickly. So I've got a little test configuration here that extends a custom class that I wrote, which is test Cassandra configuration, and it extends one of the Spring Data Cassandra classes um, that basically just requires you to set a key namespace. And optionally, you can do a few other things like actually insert, you know, specify some scripts to insert some data as well as clean up the data after the test runs and so on. So this is just a little helper class I wrote. And you can see down below I've got some uh, 
CQL here to basically create my schema. There's different ways of doing this. You can actually generate it if you're using the entity mapping as well. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit uh, in just a little bit. But for now, I just created the SQL here. And I pretty much hid this away because it's not really important for our batching operations. But basically, I wanted to show that so that basically everybody had an idea of, of how I've set this up. So the first test just basically asserts that, okay, I've got some data um, that's already existing in the Cassandra, and I can fetch that out and assert that I've got those values. And then the second one goes into both an insert and update. So I want to actually insert some data as well as update it in the same, basically, uh, transaction for Cassandra. Let's see, is that big enough? There we go. So I've, I'm adding two people here. Um, well, I'm inserting one and I'm updating another person. So uh, John Doe is an existing person. Of course, he spelled his name wrong. Everybody spells it J-O-H-N, right? So um, we update his first name to J-O-H-N, and then we add a person, and then we execute that and that will actually go off and send both operations to the database. And you can string as many of these together as you want. It's a fluent API, builder API, so you can string them all together, and then at the end of it, you just execute. Um, and then finally, my last method here is just going to um, uh, do a batch delete. So I'm gonna delete two people out of there, and I just assert that I've only got one person left at the end of this operation. So if I go ahead and run that guy, I would expect to see this to pass. <clears throat> okay, and it does. So no surprise there. Really, we just wanted to provide uh, more exposure to what the Datastax API has internally in a more spring data consistent way. And in addition to some of the things that uh, Christoph showed with the new templating APIs with the, the, the Fluent Builder APIs, we've also added something similar in Cassandra that we will look at in just a moment. But before we look at that, I wanted to basically just explain that we've also done some more cleanup in our templating. Around here. Okay. So we used to have one gigantic CQL template, Cassandra template, that had synchronous and asynchronous operations. We've actually broken those up because the API was quite large. And it might be a little bit confusing how to find something. We had a mixture of Cassandra's data stacks types, along with spring data types, along with some entity types. And so there was a large number of methods there that we, we broke out. So we had the sync template, which is just your Cassandra operations. And in addition to that, we've also got an async Cassandra operations. And it used to return an internal class or interface called cancelable, and the only method it had on it was cancelable. What, what we do now is we actually return a listenable feature, which is far more robust in terms of the functionality that it provides. And that comes straight out of the core framework. In addition to the async stuff, obviously Cassandra supports a lot of reactive things now. Under the hood, we wrap all the reactive stuff around um, basically Cassandra's async functionality. But we provide a number of operations to allow you to work with raw CQL, the statements, the data stacks types, or of course our own API. You can see down below there with the selects and so on, that uh, select one with the query and so on, that those are the internal API types that I was referring to that were real similar to what Tristoff showed with Mongo, and we're gonna cover those next. I'm not gonna really delve into the reactive story uh, too much since uh, Mark's covering that in the next session. Um, these are all the entity operations based reactive operations uh, on that template. So the query and update API, this is something we're pretty excited about because it allows you to construct queries in a more uh, fluent manner using a builder style API, and also provides a little bit of um, type safety in certain senses, but it makes it really sent, uh, easy to specify your projections as well as your criteria conditions. So we have APIs that wrap each aspect of a query, whether it's the projection, the where clause. We can limit that query. We can add, add paging and sorting to that. And in certain cases, depending on how you index things in Cassandra, there's an option to allow filtering. So if Cassandra flags that as something that um, may potentially be a performance impact to your application, it actually throws an exception, but you can re-enable that. So you might create indexes on, say, a first and last name, but maybe you only query on first name. In certain cases, Cassandra can flag that as an exception <coughs> and prevent that query from being executed if it re represents something that might be uh, uh, potentially performant cost, very costly in performance. So you can enable it with allow filtering and then Cassandra will allow that option. So I've got a little demo prepared for that as well. Okay, 
so here's an example. So this just builds off the same test configuration that I, uh, we just reviewed moments ago. And um, I've added a few more people this time, uh, a few more does, and uh, uh, yeah, in this particular example, we just got a few more people of the doe family. And we can query for adults. We can do it several different ways. So we start off with the query um, class. We start with a query, and we are going to filter it based on the last name. We're also going to look for people that are, um, uh, have an age that are, that are older than 18. We're specifying our projection, and in this particular case, based on my criteria and the way I set up my indexes, so I've created individual indexes on each of the, the attributes of the person, primarily the age, gender, and last name, but based on the way that um, I'm querying in this particular case, I think it has mostly to do with the greater than equal um, operator here. You do you are required to um, use filtering. If you do not use filtering, like I said, it will fail with an exception. And I would expect to find all the family members that are older than 18 here. I can also filter based on enum types. So in my person class in particular, it's pretty straightforward. I have an ID to specify the mapping. I have the gender, the age of the person, the name. But the gender here is just a basic enum type. So Spring Data Cassandra handles translating that type in its mapping infrastructure so that you can join it in queries or specify it in your projections and so on. And finally, with the update, you can also um, update specific records in batch style if you want, but in this particular case, we're using just the update statement in a single uh, um, transaction. And we actually use a query here to identify Everybody who's five years of age, and we're basically just going to change their age, I believe. Did I do that? ID is set to five. And my update. Oh, I'm actually just changing. Um, uh, I'm changing um, Hodo's name to HOE in the first name. So in this particular case, I'm just changing one particular um, field of a record in Cassandra's table and performing that update. So if we run this, everything should work. as we expect. So the, the, the query and update API is real nice to give you a really fluent, more Java style, you know, if you're familiar with things like query by example and some of the other spring data modules like MongoDB that Christoph showed you, this will become real familiar if you're moving between different data stores. And of course, spring data supports the ability to use different data stores within the same application. Okay, moving forward. We've also introduced paging. So previously we didn't support paging in our repository infrastructure, but it was a hot request that's been around forever, as you can tell, since it's Datacast 56. I put references to all the, the JIRA tickets that reference the, the things that we've added to the, um, uh, the module since then. But the repository infrastructure, like pretty much all the query methods and CRUD operations, all build on the templates. So you can do this either inside of the repository abstraction, or you can do it outside the repository abstraction if, you don't, if your application doesn't require that. So internally, it's just using the template. And low level, we're just wrapping Datastax API, which is in gray here, this result set, into our own types. So we can keep metadata about the paging state, we can tell what page we're on, the size of that page, and so on. So we wrap it with our own types. And Slice is an extension of the page, um, uh, an ex extension of the page class itself. The Cassandra page request, that's what you send in. That's just an instance of Pagible. So if you're used to pagination in some of the other modules, you'll be, in, you'll be uh, familiar with the Pagible uh, interface. Above that, we keep a bit more metadata. So the higher up you go in this stack here, we keep a little bit more metadata about what Cassandra gives us behind the scenes from that API. So prepare to demo here for this. All right, so again, I've added a little bit more data this time around. Um, in addition to my Doe family, I've added some other, some other users here. And what I'm basically gonna do is, I'm going to, oh, I've got a repository. Let me back up a minute, show you the repository. So it's just a plain CRUD repository, as you would expect. Actually, Cassandra repository extends that. Um, 
And I've added a method there, find all sliced by last name. So I'm gonna query for this group of users or this family, my data by last name, and then I'm gonna send in a pageable, a request of how many results I want back in a particular request, and then I can fetch the next page and so on. <clears throat> yep, sorry. Just close that, all right. So with my person repository, I can actually invoke that method, search for all does, and maybe only on my first request, I only want the first four records. I assert that my size that I get back is only four records, and then I fill up my result set. Maybe I'm gonna collect it in some collection or, or what have you, you can put it in whatever you like. Uh, and then I basically assert that we have another page to fetch because there's seven does in total. I wanna fetch all of them, but I wanna, I'm paged. Maybe I'm displaying this in a UI right, I only want to um, select the first four or however many users you are, or records you have that you want to fetch. And then I assert that I only have three left. And in the end, I, just, I assert that basically all of these are actually in my result set for my entire collection. Of course, you could apply other filtering if you want to basically reduce the size of your result set, but in this case, I'm just returning them all, so I'm just gonna run that. And then of course that passes as expected. Okay, so <clears throat> Okay. So the last bit is of course we've added reactive support to Spring Data Cassandra and we have a reactive Cassandra repository which just extends the Spring Data Commons Reactive CRUD repository and introduces methods to basically persist your entities. And the thing that you'll notice that's most important there is that you'll see the reactor types. You'll see the mono types being returned where you're only expecting a single result. And you'll see the flux type returned when you're expecting a collection of results. And it's all um, asynchronously done there. The Reactive CRUD repository is quite extensive. It contains some other methods that allow, methods allow you to find things, um, delete things, and, and so on in a very reactive nature. But like I said, we're gonna save that for the next talk. Some other notables in Spring Data Cassandra. So we have support for multiple key spaces. Um, allows you to uh, specify more than one key space if you've got your tables divided, divided up. You can think of key space as like a database or a schema in like Oracle's database or something like that. Support for lightweight transactions that basically is insert and update if not exist type things. And the algorithm there is the Paxos algorithm that uses a compare and set. It's quite interesting. Um, so we've added support for that in Spring Data. We've also got session routing, which, my, my apologies, back. Um, which basically is an abstraction around the cluster. So when you, when you build out a client application that connects to a Cassandra cluster, you start with the cluster and your contact endpoints, and then you get a session from that. Uh, we have our own um, session factory abstraction now to wrap that and allow you to customize how you wanna um, get access to your session and your applications. We also support indexes on your entity fields. So at index on like say a property of an entity or an attribute or field, excuse me, Along with SASE indexes, it's a different type of index there, so you can annotate your, your property fields or methods with at indexed or at SASE indexes. And we'll actually automatically generate those too if you're using the schema generation. So Spring Data Cassandra allows you to generate the schema based on your entities, as I mentioned earlier. It'll also generate your indexes as well. And then we briefly talked about um, allow filtering, adding support for that. And on the repository abstraction, that's really nice. So if you have a query where that query requires you to allow filtering, then all you have to do is add the allow filtering annotation to your repository query method. Okay, moving on. Spring Data Gemfire and Geode. So, how many people here are using any of these modules? One, few, okay, good. All right, so the big news there, effectively, as of K, we've added the Spring Data Geode module as a module to the release train as of K. It used to be standalone, and the one main reason for that is, is Apache Cassandra hadn't re reached final GA yet itself, 
and uh, there was no release version of that. But as of November of last year, um, Apache Geo did go top level project in the Apache Software Foundation as well as had their first release. And it was time to actually roll Spring Data Geode into the release train. Um, my whole theme around Spring Data Gemfire and Geode this year has been around keeping things simple. To take a quote from Alan Kay, simple things should be simple, complex things should be possible. If you've used a data store like Gemfire or Geode in the past, you can realize how easy it is to get lost in all the menagerie of details and the complexity. So what I've really tried to do in this release is boil it down and try to keep things very simple and get people up and running as quickly and easily as possible. And we're gonna take a look at what that means, but we do, it in, we do that in a spring data way. The other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to make the journey to the cloud very simple. So the experience that you have on your local desktop isn't any different than your experience if you were to push your application to a cloud environment like PCF. One of the ways that uh, I made that simpler is that basically Spring Data Gemfire and Spring Data Geode are interchangeable. You can start with the open source version. So people that aren't familiar with Apache Geode or Pivotal Gemfire, Apache Geode is the open source version, obviously, and Pivotal Gemfire is the commercial thing that uh, Pivotal supports and builds on top of the open source version there. Those are interchangeable as of 2.0. So if you start with open source and you went commercial, swap your dependency, no change to your application, and vice versa. You can move back to Apache Geode. One of the reasons why that's possible is because Spring Data Geode 2 is built on Apache Geode 1.2. Spring Data Gemfire 2 is built on Pivotal Gemfire 9.1, which is built on Apache Geode 1.2. You'll see some oddities in the code base because there's still things that are named Gemfire and Apache Geode, and Pivotal Gemfire uses the org Apache Geode namespace. Those things aren't going to change, and rest assured, I'm not planning on changing any of those things in Spring Data Gemfire or Geode. Otherwise, it would require you to change your imports. And as I already stated, I really don't want any application changes to the user's applications. The whole idea, too, in terms of the simplicity, is that you should be able to do everything inside your IDE. You really shouldn't have to rely on a lot of external tools to basically get something very simple up and running quickly. So the idea that I came up with was to add more annotation support in the way that basically Spring Boot does things for you today with auto configuration. However, Spring Data Gemfire is a little bit more explicit and declarative in that you specify the features that you want to use to enable things in Spring Data Gemfire. So while it does use convention over configuration, what it really means is that basically I'm providing with you sensible defaults out of the box, right? So there's a lot of different knobs and configuration settings for Gemfire and Geode. It uses all the defaults that would make an application simple to start up and run quickly without a lot of fuss while still providing you with a lot of power to basically customize that if you need to. So to get started, all you need to do is actually, like a Spring Boot application, annotate your class with at client cache application. That will give you a client cache instance that you can use to either store data locally or connect to a server. Um, and it sets up a, basically a default pool for you for connections that connect to that server. Or you can add more pools if you want. I've also added the ability to give you features such as uh, things such as what Hibernate would give you. You can generate, like say, your data structures in the back and then store your data automatically. Hibernate generates tables for you. Spring Data Gemfire generates what's called regions. So your cache is divided up in the regions. You can think of regions as tables. I've also given you the ability to uh, enable indexing. So like some of the other modules where you can add indexed attributes, uh, fields, or properties, you can enable indexing, it'll actually generate those indexes for you automatically just based on the annotations on your entities. As you can see below here, I have a customer that's mapped to the customer's region. There's three annotations, your ID to identify the ID for your entity, as well as the indexes. And Apache Geode even supports Lucene indexing, so you can do textual-based searches in an Apache Geode cluster using Lucene queries and so on. And you can generate queries from that as well. You can do caching defined regions. So um, if you're using Spring's cache abstraction and you've specified a bunch of caches where you want to cache data, you can use Gemfire Geode as a caching provider. And it's real simple to enable. You don't have to worry about specifying the cache manager. You don't have to worry about creating regions for all the caches that your application uses. All you say is enable the Gemfire caching feature, which will position Gemfire or Geode as a caching provider in Spring's abstraction. And then it'll enable uh, caching defined regions and create regions to store the cacheable data like accounts, for instance. If you're using a client-server model and you want to push all this to the server, um, 
and not have to go into like external tools like GFish to like set up regions and fossil indexes and do all that stuff. There's another annotation called enable cluster configuration that basically sends all the configuration from the client up to the server. So whenever you write something in your client, you have to have a local region that proxies to the server. It'll create those local regions for you, but it doesn't necessarily create the server side regions. So in order to make the client server topology real simple to use, you just use the enable cluster configuration and it sends it up so that Gemfire will actually be configured in the way that the server will be configured in the way that your client expects. That does require you to, require you to however, to actually have a full installation of either Gemfire or Apache Geode on your class path or um, to start those up. You can't simply use the jar there because it contains additional functionality to make that happen. There's support for continuous queries, so that's an inventing mechanism in Spring Data Gemfire and Geode where um, if I want to register interest in some events that happen as data is being updated, you know, maybe the data changes, a stock price goes up or down, right? I want to be notified about that. Gemfire has a continuous query mechanism where I can actually register a CQ that specifies a query pre predicate so that anytime that data changes, I get notified about it. It becomes real simple to actually uh, enable just by enabling the continuous query feature as well as annotating your callback method. Just a plain old POJO with an at qu continuous query annotation that specifies your query, the name of that query, and you're up and running. You'll get those events. Um, there's some serialization enabling here for PDX. Security is real simple to enable. So if you have a secure client server, um, whether you're using auth as well as SSL, all you have to do is at enable security, specify your username and password in the application properties file for a Spring Boot application that'll connect up to the server. The SSL provides options for you to provide, uh, to, to specify your, your key and trust stores and, and set other SSL options. If you just add these annotations out of the box, it doesn't require you to set any properties. Most of them are basically, they provide the sensible defaults for you out of the box. Just by specifying the annotation, it enables that behavior. And then there's some additional annotations to set some other things in Gemfire, like it's logging level, if you need to turn up logging to see what's going on and additional Gemfire properties, which aren't as, um, uh, probably as um, typically used in your application, but it's still accessible. So what I wanna do is just do a real quick demo. I think we're getting pretty short on time here, so I have to speed along. Um, switch over to my other one, okay. So if I wanted to build, let's say I want to build a customer application where I just want to store some data, right? Now, if I was working with Madura, she probably would say I need to write a test first, but we're going to skip all that for now for the sake of time and just create my customer. Okay. Data. I'm going to take advantage of a, a framework called Lombok to basically simplify the construction of this, but I need to tell it what region it goes into. So this goes into customers, and we're going to use a required ARDS constructor, static name. Oh, sorry. Get rid of that. Okay. Okay. ID, private. We're just gonna keep a little bit of data about our customer right now and we can add to it later. Right now we just wanna get something up as quickly as possible. And maybe this is indexed. And this is non null. Okay, so now we got a basic customer. We're gonna need a repository to basically store that information into Gemfire Geode. So I'll create a quick customer repository which is an interface. And we can just extend CRUD repository. We don't need to extend any more specific than that. Which is a customer. And the type was long. And maybe I might want to look up that customer by um, name, like. That's why I had a query method there. I can even enable some other features in Gemfire just on the repository itself, like maybe I want to provide tracing for that, that query. I can just enable trace and the log details about it, like the index it used, how long that query ran, and so on. Um, shoot. 
Let's move that into a package. Can't see that. Way. Ah well, we don't need to do that. Okay, so the final thing we need is this we need an application class. So let me add that. To bootstrap everything. And I like to use Spring Boot, as everybody likes to use Spring Boot. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna create a client application that uses Spring Boot. Real simple to create at Spring Boot application. And we'll add our main method here first. Spring Builder. Okay. And so we have our client application class. Expand that a little bit so we can see it. Now to make it a client application, like I said, we just add client cache application. I want to enable the repository so I can enable Gemfire repositories. And I'm going to give it the, um, basically our class, the customer repository class itself to basically limit the scan. So if you have a lot of repositories and a lot of different classes in your application, you can just limit that, no big deal. And as I was saying earlier, I don't wanna, I don't wanna have to create this region locally. I don't wanna have to create any factory beans or any bean definitions to create the region. So I'm just gonna add at enable entity defined regions. And in this particular case, I'm gonna create entities based on my customer class. So I can actually filter here as well, limit the scan to this. And for now, we're just gonna make this a local region. So the shortcut, client region shortcut is local. This just tells Gemfire that I want this region to be local. Don't send any data to the server at first. So if I run this, this should work. Well, it's actually not gonna do anything because we haven't actually done anything with our repository yet. And I think it might be complaining about my repository as well, demo.app, okay. Drop this in there, okay. All right, so I've already wrote some code to basically use our customer repository. Oops, I want to do that. Static search. There we go. Okay, so basically, just use the repository to save it, get it back out with the query, and if I run that, we should see something go now. Uh, that's because my client application is a default package. I'm drop it in there. Stop. Okay. Run that. All right. Sorry about that. Okay, so it works as expected. No problem. Now, if I just want to change this to use a server, real simple, all I have to do is remove this. Gemfire by default creates a pool that's gonna try to connect directly to a cache server. There's different ways of connecting to your cluster. The most preferred way is to connect to what's called a locator, which basically allows you to find all your cache servers. And that handles things like load balancing as well as routing. If you have like specific data that's partitioned across your cluster, it can actually go directly to the node, what we call single hop, and fetch that data directly from that node rather than requesting it from one server. The server doesn't have your data and has to bounce to another server, right? So, um, makes that real convenient. But of course this application would fail because we don't have any server. But I'm not gonna create a server in Spring this time, I'm actually just gonna bootstrap that up in um, Gfish. If you come to my talks tomorrow, I'm actually gonna show how to do that from Spring as well. I've actually already got a script prepared that we can do this. Oops, start cluster. So this is that locator mechanism I was telling you about. So I'm gonna go back to my client application while that's starting up, and we're gonna do a couple things. Whoops, to make, 
That's simpler. Mm. It's not that. Okay, so in the client application, I want to tell it that I'm going to connect via locator. So locators. And the connect via locator is real simple. I just say at locator here. And now it's going to use that locator. As I said, we took away the local, so now it's going to try to push that configuration up to the server. It's just a proxy region, so it's not going to keep any state, but you can actually call, you can actually create a caching proxy. So it'll be a near cache and keep the state local as well as on the server, and it'll also keep in sync between the server as well. Gemfire takes care of all that stuff behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about any of that. Um, our, our guy should be started up. Okay, so we have some members now. What we don't have right now is we don't have a region on that server, and we also have to keep in mind that our types aren't serializable. So in order to send something over the wider, we have to serialize that data, right? Um, but if you have a large number of regions that you've created, like tables, right? You might have thousands of tables in your database. You might have a lot of types that you need to implement serializable. Gemfire actually has its own serialization mechanisms. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. All you say is at enable PDX, which is Gemfire's PDX, which is its serialization framework. And the nice thing about that is it allows you to query data in a serialized format. You don't have to deserialize that data to actually query it. Um, and all I have to do is add at enable PDX and it will serialize all my types. So it uses an internal serializer in Spring Data Gemfire that identifies my types. Okay, one last thing. I'm getting use HTTP. So to do this cluster configuration push, um, I want to send this, this configuration up to the server and I don't want to have to do all this stuff in GFish. All I have to do is add enable cluster configuration that takes in information from the client and pushes it up to the server. And I'm not going to demonstrate that since we're really low on time, but if you come to my talk tomorrow, we're actually going to be doing this exclusively in more, much more detail. So anyway, thank you, and I'll hand it back over to Christoph. Okay, we're already a bit over time. Uh, I got, yeah, two minutes left or so. Uh, the promised sneak peek on uh, the upcoming release, Train Loveless. Uh, for MongoDB, what we are currently working on is distinct queries. So you basically can have, uh, if you know MongoDB, it's completely schemaless. So you can have uh, multiple different typed values within uh, one property. And what we allow you to do is basically load those distinct values for a certain property and convert those into the correct types. I prepared a sample. If you want to check it out, it's there. Just various types and distinct queries are really nice feature that we're going to support. For Redis, we're going to focus on pushing uh, a master-slave scenario. So basically, uh, write uh, data to your master node while uh, just reading from the slave. Uh, this will be available for Lettish, uh, at least. And we're going to focus on reactive PubSub. So if you know Redis, you know that it has this publish-subscribe mechanism. Uh, we did this uh, in the past in the imperative world with a... a message listener container, we're going to do it reactively in Loveless. And this is one thing I'm personally very excited about. We're gonna, uh, going to add uh, probably a JDBC module, so working directly with uh, JDBC and having JDBC repositories. And there is also a sample that I'll just, let me show it to you. So this is the JDBC preview. Where is it? JDBC preview. Uh, you will just have to have uh, enter the at enable JDBC repositories, then give it the data access strategy, and then you can basically uh, go on with the repository uh, just using plain JDBC. There will be an IBATIS integration as well, so you can switch between IBATIS and the, the uh, Spring Data JDBC implementation uh, seamlessly, or you can even combine the two if you want to. So this is really, really cool stuff coming, hopefully, with Loveless. We're uh, eagerly working on it. And of course, John did mention there is a Gemfire test that's just mocking Gemfire's uh, objects out so that your tests can get faster in unit tests. And for the guys using Elasticsearch, I guess you've been waiting for that. This is a shout out to all the guys up there, Mosin, Artur, Nikita, Julian, and Alexander, who are currently working on the support for Elasticsearch 6 and the Elasticsearch high-level REST client. So no more node and transport client, but uh, really focusing on HTTP support up there. So cool work, guys. Uh, keep it up. And we're looking forward to having Elasticsearch 6 support, decent Elasticsearch 6 support for the Loveless release. 
Uh, uh, NeoVJ promised us to, do, to work on their async support as well as the reactive ones. Uh, we're also looking forward to that. And with that, I thank you for your time. We're a bit over, uh, sorry for that. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>